Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this university information session. Um, my name is Jason. I'll be the host today. <coughs> but more importantly, we've got four fantastically knowledgeable reps from American universities here. Um, and they will be talking to you about their universities and about the US admissions process um, and answering any of your questions that you have um, at the end. So the way it's going to work is that we're going to introduce the speakers first of all and then they're going to give very short presentations about their universities um, and then we're going to have a Q&A session for about 30-35 minutes at the end. Just to let you know there is a Q&A um, option at the bottom of your screen you should be able to click on that and type any questions you have. I'll be asking the presenters questions at the end so feel free to type them as we go. Um, feel free to jot any other ones down you have and um, we won't be answering any questions during the presentations, but we'll be doing it at the end. So these universities all have offices in London, and normally at this time of year, they would be going around to schools pretty much non-stop, talking about their universities and about the admissions process. But obviously, they can't be doing that at the moment. So we thought it would be a good idea to get everyone together and to um, talk about the US and US colleges and their universities all in one go. So thank you very much to everyone for joining and listening. And thank you in particular for these presenters joining today. We have with us James Farrell, who is the director of the London office of USC, that is the University of Southern California. We have Lisa Mortini, who's the assistant director of admissions at NYU, um, also based in London. We have uh, Don Bishop, who's head of admissions and financial aid at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. And we have Katie Behringer, who is the Assistant Director of FSU, Florida State University in London. So they'll be giving an introduction to their, themselves and their universities, just five minutes each, and then we'll be doing Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to James Farrell, and I'm going to be starting his presentation. Take it away, James. Hello, thank you, Jason. I've got a very brief um, presentation. There's some imagery that will roll along as, I, as I'm talking. I'll give a very brief overview of, of USC and then um, in the second part of the presentation, we can answer some questions and any more kind of specific questions you have, we'll kind of deal with then. Um, USC, we're a private non-for-profit tier one research institution. Um, as, as the name suggests, we're based in, in Southern California. We're about 10 minutes from, from downtown LA and about half an hour from, from Santa Monica. So we've got the mountains on, on one side and, and the, the ocean on the other. Um, we're, we're a campus university. Um, we've just built a 1.2 million square foot student village. Um, we describe ourselves as big small. Um, and what I mean by that is we're, we're big in the sense that we're a university with uh, you know, we're a tier one research institution. We have a student population of, of upwards of, of 45,000. Um, we're the biggest employer in, in Los Angeles. And we have an alumni network across the globe that, 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 that's in the region of 400,000 people. Um, but we also consider ourselves small in the sense that there's a student to faculty ratio of, of eight to one and the average class size is, is 26. Um, I mentioned the student population. Most of the student population, certainly the undergraduate student population, live in and around campus. So I know, I know in the UK it's it's common for students to live at home and travel in, and and although that does happen, it's it's at a much smaller scale at USC. We we really try to build a community within a community. We're very proud to be part of LA. We we were founded in in 1880 when LA was a a, a much smaller town, and we've we've grew with the city and the city is a big part of USC and we're a big part of LA but we really try to be a community within a community so most students live on campus we have a thousand clubs and societies that students are involved with everything from I think we've got a frisbee club to a quidditch club and and, and kind of everything in between um, in terms of the academic programs there were 100 academic programs to, to choose from at USC um, and we're really proud of our interdisciplinary offering and I know that's something that for UK students might not necessarily be the norm and it's a lot more common in the US but we have we have some world-leading schools in their own right at, at USC from the Dawn site 
Dawnside College of, of Letters, Arts and Sciences. We have an architecture school. We have our world famous School of Cinematic Arts, um, the Turby School of Engineering, the Marshall School of Business, the Annenberg School of, of Journalism. Um, and what we really try and encourage is for all of our students, all of these schools are available. All You can double major, major, minor. And what we want at USC is we want students to um to, to really discover passions and find passions and we really want to support students w with that i think the the stat that i loved the most at usc was that the third most popular minor for our engineering students last year was theater studies um, and i think that says a lot about the type of, of of university um we are and i'll finish on just the kind of feel on, on campus as well you can see the kind of the the la memorial coliseum in, in the pictures now and um, that's our, our, our football stadium we're a very spirited um university so that's it's not to say that you need to be a kind of a, a top level athlete to, to come to usc but the general feel around campus is we're quite a sporty we're i guess a rah rah university some some might describe us i think there's a there's a, there's a great stat that if USC was a country, we'd be 11th in the all-time Olympic medal table. So just to give you a feel of, of, of what USC is about and the kind of the general feeling on, on campus. Um, from, a, from an academic perspective, we're a very selective university. Um, we have a, 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 an admission rate of, of somewhere between 11 and 15%. I say somewhere between because the, the figures have just come into us this week from, from this year. Um, but we're a very selective university, but we're also a very international university. So we're, we're very proud to have a very diverse campus. I think we're the second most international university in the US and I think the 10th most popular for UK students and um, and that's something that we we really push and I think you'll find from a lot of uh, selective universities it's not necessarily about the number of students that uh, that the, 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 the universities are trying to get it's actually getting the right students and getting a really kind of well-rounded diverse student population um, so that's a kind of very brief overview of USC um, and, and I'm happy to answer all of you know the questions later on in the, in the presentation and and of course after the presentation as well I'm, I'm happy to to help if I can. Great thank you very much James. Um, I'm now going to um, move on to Lisa Mortini from uh, NYU. Hi Lisa. Lisa take it away. Sure thanks Jason. Um, Hi, my name is Lisa Mortini. So I'm one of the assistant direct, uh, director of admissions for NYU. I'm actually based out of the London office. I work for the global admissions team. So we mostly uh, cover international applicants, but I'm also a New York Abu Dhabi specialist. And you're gonna ask me, what does that mean? Well, you'll find out in a minute what that means. So a lot of my efforts are concentrated on uh, supporting the our Abu Dhabi campus. Um, let me tell you a tiny bit about NYU. We are one of the largest private research uh, universities in the US at 50,000 students. Um, and we're pretty much a university that's in and out of the city of New York, but also in and out of the rest of the world. So Jason, if we can have the next slide, please. You'll recognize some of those locations. On your left, we have New York in the middle, Abu Dhabi, and on the right, Shanghai. So these are the three cities where our main campuses are located. What that means is that we have three degree granting campuses. So you can start your studies and finish your studies in New York, in Abu Dhabi, or in Shanghai. We also have 11 study away sites around the world that are purely NYU uh, sites. Um, I work out of the London sites, but we also have sites in Tel Aviv, in Accra, in Buenos Aires, in Sydney, in Prague, in Berlin, uh, all across uh, different European countries. So in Washington DC as well, for those interested in maybe public policy. Uh, so this really allows you to learn not only in those three major cities, but also around the world, because most of our students will go on one to two study away experiences. So just to give you a sense as to our main campuses, the New York campus is the largest one. It is an urban campus. So if you've been to New York, and chances are, you know, you may have. If you've gone down to Washington Square Park at the bottom of Fifth Avenue, you've been to NYU. We're pretty much everywhere around 13 block radius from the square. Um, and this is our largest campus. It hosts 10 different schools at undergraduate level. The most famous schools are the biggest one. That's our College of Arts and Science. 
but also more specialized professional schools like Stern School of Business, Tisch School of Arts, or Tandon or School of Engineering. We also have a really cool school that's fairly unique called Gallatin, which is a school of individualized study, and it allows you to tailor your major. So you can create your own major. And that is something that's really important to know about NYU is that we are operating under the liberal arts college, the liberal arts um, uh, educational system. And what that means is that you will have to take a core, but you also will have to decide your uh, major and minor, so your areas of studies by the end of your second year out of a four year degree. So you don't have to choose straight away. And that is very different from the system in the UK or uh, across Europe. If we can have the next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit of a sense as to the type of student that we're looking for, we are looking for students who are super proactive really ready to get hands-on uh, active within the community so we have a lot of student clubs we have a lot of labs uh, a lot of performance um, uh, spaces that we want our students to be active within and that's very important because if you're looking for a university where it's maybe more on the sort of just opening a book and reading from a book and you know this isn't going to be nyu we want you to challenge ideas we want you to think differently and we want you to also not be afraid to be challenged because it's not easy we are the school that is the you know apparently just in front of usc we are the school that actually uh, enrolls the most international students in the us we also are the school that receive the most applications uh, of all schools in the US. So a fairly sort of, I want to say, competitive process, but we also are looking for people who bring in something to the community. Um, just to give you a sense also of our application process, so we are under the common application and we are what we call test flexible so what that means is that if you guys are uh, right now in the uk or across europe doing the a levels or the ib for instance and many other programs uh, you will be able to apply to nyu without taking the sat or the act and that's really good news um, but we are a competitive university um, we are looking for people who will be able to demonstrate academic strength and also demonstrate a good array of extracurricular activities. We can maybe go to the next slide. And so talking about academics, one of the best um, uh, opportunity that you will have at NYU is to learn from people who are incredibly active within uh, the world around them. So your professors will be people who um, have been working in or researching in the field that they teach. And being located in these incredible cities really give us access to attract but also retain incredible faculty we have a good faculty to um, student ratio i think in new york it's around nine to ten um, uh, so i'm sorry nine to one or ten to one in abu dhabi it's a smaller campus so a little less than that so um, this is really something that uh, if you are looking for a large university where you can still have a connection to the faculty members that's something that you will get at nyu one of the good things as well that we've uh, had through this process is that we want you to be able, as I mentioned before, to challenge things. So when you're learning at NYU, we want you to be proactive in the classroom, raise your hand, have a conversation with the faculty. And that might be a bit different than what you might be used to in your home country, but that's something that we really value. And our next slide. Thank you, Jason. And I would say this is more or less a little bit of a, um, of a casual slide for our last slide because we are trying to help you with your uh, academic development, with your personal development, with your professional development, so that when you leave NYU, you'll be comfortable anywhere and successful everywhere. And this comfortable anywhere is really important to me. And I want to go back to some of our campuses here because the NYU campus, especially in New York, is very, very different offering than the uh, campus in Abu Dhabi. When we have 24 uh, subject areas you can study, when it's a smaller campus of about 1,300, 1,400 students who will be studying and living in close quarters together. In Shanghai, our campus is even smaller and it's located in Pudong in the heart of the financial district. But if you're studying in New York, you're right in the heart of the city. And so you need to make sure that this is okay for you, that you're happy to be in a campus where we have no gates, we have no borders. It is quite an open space for you to explore the campus life, but also the city around you. So we want you to feel comfortable in these areas. And we want you to be successful everywhere. So we know um, that our students will be interested in a lot of uh, career support as well as, uh, you know, 
support for potential graduate school applications. So our three campuses will offer you a lot of dedicated support in these areas, but we won't be holding your hand. And that goes back to my idea of who we're looking for, proactive student that will make the best use of our resources to be able to be successful. And we're very, very proud of what our, our students have achieved. Uh, within six months po upon graduation, about 93% of our students are employed. Um, for instance, on the Abu Dhabi campus, um, since the campus started 10 years ago, we've produced 14 Rhodes Scholars. So really high level of academics. Our, um, uh, students who graduate from the Shanghai campus all graduate with a high level of Mandarin fluency, which is really crucial in this day and age in the job market. So again, this all ties in together with this idea of who we are trying to um, help you become through this journey. And finally, finally, I'm pretty sure I'm out of time, so <laughs> I just want to go to my final, final slide, which is if you have any questions, Seriously, just drop me an email. Like, it's super important that you don't feel that you can't talk to us. And I'm pretty sure my colleagues will say the same. Um, it's really important that if you have a question through this process, because it's so different from what you might know from home, please get in touch. Ask us questions. We're really there to help you put in a strong application to our schools. And so um, feel free to write down this email and ask me any questions after the webinar. Thank you, so guys. Thank you again so much for listening. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. I'm going to pass over to Don now. Great, uh, well, thank you. And uh, thank you for all uh, listening in. Jason, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I have put together a fair number of slides and I'll go through them quickly knowing that these are all available to you and Jason will be sending them to you. Uh, but we're delighted to uh, know, go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, past four years, we've enrolled about 80 students from your home area. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, the type of schools that they've come from, it's not limited to this, but these are probably the ones that have the most numerous applications and admits. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, if you can see that well enough, you'll see in the forefront, uh, we have these large stone uh, structures as a sculpture, and it's called dome heads. So there is some British influence even on the campus. If you go to the next slide, um, I'll try to position Notre Dame for you. There are a fair number of people to, for most people, Notre Dame's famous, but not everybody knows it in the way that we do. Uh, we're among the top 10 or 15 most selective colleges in America. In America, out of the top 20 national research universities, 18 are actually private. So unlike in London and England, where the vast majority of prestige institutions are public, in the United States, it's the reverse. And uh, just know that there are many more American universities and there are about 2,000 of them. If you look at the top half of 1% of, of the Americans and where do they go, these are often identified as national merit scholars, not counting the national scholarships that colleges pay for. And we've always been rated in the top 10 of that group, and we're very proud of that. Go to the next slide. Um, but in addition, uh, what we've really tried hard is create the resources to be a top 10 university in the United States. So our endowment uh, currently is in the top 10, the success of our alumni at the very top uh, corporations. We've also built a huge global awareness program where our students, uh, we have a, a very large facility in London, but overall we try to get our students out uh, around the world as part of their four-year experience at Notre Dame. We are based 90 miles south of Chicago, so we're not in a big city, so we try to make sure that while our students come from everywhere, they go everywhere during their four years at the university. And go to the next slide. Uh, we've added $1.5 billion in new buildings in just the past eight years, and we will complete uh, some of these projects over the next three. Uh, that gives you an idea of the campus a little bit. Uh, it doesn't cover all the campus, but for a school of around 8,600 undergraduates and another 3,000 graduate professional students, it's actually considered a very large campus. Among the top 15 most selective colleges, we're actually the third largest at 8,600. So we're actually not small, given the context of the group we, we tend to overlap with. 
go to the next slide. Um, also, we're very diverse geographically. We, we actually enroll more students from the East Coast and the Southeast than we do the Midwest. Our largest cities are New York, Chicago, LA, Washington, DC, Boston, Atlanta, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Miami, Dallas, and Minneapolis. That's just in America, London, Beijing, uh, other countries, uh, Sa uh, Sao Paulo and Brazil. So you're gonna get students from everywhere. Uh, we've become more international as well. Uh, we're not as international as a lot of the schools and probably of, of the schools today, we may be the least. Uh, we're working hard to keep increasing that. But one of the things that our international kids really like is they meet Americans from everywhere, from every background. It is more geographically diverse than, than any other private university in the US. I'll go ahead and flip the slide. Uh, we are a national research university, and, and as a result, uh, we really put a lot of emphasis on research, but our student-faculty ratio is very small. It's about eight to one. Also, we have our top faculty teaching undergraduates. That is not always the case at all schools. And uh, we rank in the top 10 for, actually, we rank in the top 10 easily for undergraduate education of access to research for undergraduates to participate with faculty. And uh, we rank first in the country on graduation rate. So generally our students who come here seem to be very happy. If you'd switch to the next slide. Uh, we've built a college town around our university. So along with the campus, there are some amenities that I think you'll enjoy. Uh, go ahead and to the next slide and then to the next slide. Um, you know, I think this is the most important slide. Notre Dame is not just a top 10 or 15 university in the United States. We're the leading Catholic university in the United States. We're the leading faith-based university in the United States. And what I think that does for those of us who have come here is we don't want to just be at a top 10 school. We want a top 10 school that really focuses not just on our academic development, but a sense of personal formation, ethics, and values. And this is our brand that's out there in America and I think across the world, that you don't just come to Notre Dame to be successful for yourself. You come here to become a big impact on the lives of others. If you would go ahead and flip two more slides. Um, our students come to do all sorts of studies, a quarter in science, quarter in business, quarter in engineering, architecture, quarter in, in the liberal arts. Um, we rank second in, in the American universities for sending students abroad for programs, both academic programs, research programs, but also community service programs. We also have one of the most highly funded innovation parks idea center for students to do startups while they're undergraduates. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, students get very involved globally on in community service. They love the athletics at Notre Dame, the residential hall stay system. Uh, we are so close knit that the vast majority of students live on campus all four years. And then you have the alumni network for the rest of your life. Uh, the last couple slides I'm not gonna make comment on other than just to finish up with what we're looking for in admissions. We could fill our class with students at 35 or 36 ACT or 1550 or above, less than half those students gain admission. Only about a third of the students in the top 1% of the United States gain admission who apply. We're really looking for your motivation in your success and what your motivations are. We're looking for, as we put here in the comments, uh, deep thinkers, people that want to take some risk, but also they have a desire to give more in their life to others than what they take. You go ahead and go to the, the next slide. And then the last thing, just from holistic, so what you write in your essays, uh, what you talk about, what your goals are, and then what your high school says about you, we really use that very aggressively in selection. So it's not just a numbers uh, game. And we are also text flex flexible for international students that we don't require the SAT or ACT. We'll take the full version of your academic materials and make a judgment on that. So thanks for listening. Great, thanks very much, John. And I, I should say thank you very much, John, for joining us from Indiana. Um, 
although Notre Dame has a, a, a large building in London, um, Don is based in Indiana, although would normally be over in London at this time of year. So thanks for joining us from across the Atlantic. Last but not least, um, we come on to Katie uh, from Florida State. And I will move on to your presentation. That's the wrong one. Close. <laughs> There we go. Great. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, I come to you to talk about Florida State University. We're a little bit different than the other three presenters in the fact that we are actually a public university. So that means that we have funding and our, our fees structured in a bit of a different way than other public colleges like NYU and USC and Notre Dame would have. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about a different kind of university that you would have um, and a different experience you'd have at Florida State. It's difficult to think of all the things I want to say about the university in five minutes, but I'll do my very best for you. Uh, first and foremost, we're located in Tallahassee, which is the state's capital. Um, that means that we are located in a medium-sized city in the state but we um, are also just a actual campus. Um, we're our, our own little bubble that's based inside of a city, which is really nice. So you can have a lot of um, access to amenities around the city um, outside of the campus as well. So you can really get that dual experience of being on a campus in that little campus bubble, but also um, be going into the community. And we're also about 30 minutes from the beach in the Gulf of Mexico, which is not bad either. Um, we've been really proud the last few years that we've grown in our rankings quite significantly. We're now ranked number 18 in the United States out of all public institutions. Um, considering the thousands that there are in the US, this means that we really have grown um, quite high academically and we've put a really big um, emphasis on our academic rigor. Um, which uh, we'll talk about now. Um, we offer 106 different undergraduate courses, ranging in everything from the humanities to the hard sciences. Hard sciences. So genuinely, just about any subject that you're looking to get involved in, we're able to offer that on our campus, which is which is really great, especially for those students that aren't quite sure what they want to major in. When you come to a place like Florida State, you can come in as an undecided student really figure out what you're passionate about, what you're interested in, and there's a very good likelihood that we'll offer those courses that will appeal to you and can eventually become what you end up studying. Um, some of our most popular courses on campus are criminology and business. Um, our theater and film school are quite renowned, and we've also been ranked quite highly recently in our business school, particularly with business risk management and real estate, um, as well as our hospitality school is very well known internationally. Um, just a couple other bits as well. We're a medium to large size campus. We've got about 40,000 students that are, are going around, though it doesn't feel that crowded. In fact, we're quite student focused um, and our, our ratio in the classroom is quite small when you get into your major. So while there's a lot of people around you, um, it doesn't feel that small. We'll go to our next, next slide. Right, so um, a bit about our student life on campus. Um, we're huge, as I said, we've got 40,000 students. So there's tons of opportunities to get involved in just about anything you want to do. Um, the really organized and passionate groups on campus, you would be involved with the student union, the Creek Life, or our student government um, are very, very organized and uh, students love being involved in those. But beyond that, um, James mentioned a Quidditch team. We have one of those. Um, anything from knitting to Chinese club to Quidditch, we also have those clubs on campus. So I heard a, com a lot of common themes from the other presenters here. I think we all agree that we are all universities that really want students that are very infested, very involved. We want students that are gonna show up and create a club, join a club. Um, and Florida State is another one of those universities without a doubt. Um, we have lots of opportunities to live on campus, which we're often asked about. Um, our housing opportunities are um, available for all of our first year students, especially international. Something really important about Florida State though, especially if you are a STEM student, is that uh, we have a lot of undergraduate research opportunities available for our undergraduate students, which is not really something that students can get involved in, particularly in years one and two, but even in years three and four at universities. So, we draw a strong science section. We're the strongest um, STEM public university in the state of Florida. So for students that are looking to get that STEM experience in Florida, that's going to be through us. Um, and we're also a big sports university, whether you play sports or you just like going to them, uh, we have a big sports culture. We won the football national championship about six years ago. Not so great anymore, but we will be great once again. Next slide. 
So um, a main reason that I'm based here in London is actually to support our international programs. So Florida State University has four international campuses. We've got one here in London, one in Valencia, Spain, Florence, Italy, and Panama in Central America. These campuses are not degree granting, so you wouldn't be able to go to them for all four years, but you would be able to start your university experience at Florida State by attending one of these campuses internationally. So students that are admitted to FSU can certainly go straight to our main campus in Tallahassee and enjoy all four years there. But some of our students that we're looking for who want a bit more international exposure, are a bit more edgy and adventurous and want to do something a little bit different than their peers, might consider our first year abroad program where they can spend their entire first year of studying at one of these international campuses. Um, a huge benefit of studying at one of our international campuses first and then going to Florida State for the next three years where you'll graduate will be that those students who successfully complete that year are actually eligible for 70% off of their tuition fees after the first year. Um, to highlight it very quickly, students that are not from the United States and are not from Florida in particular must pay out-of-state tuition, which is around, oh Lord, I'm so sorry, there we go, timing on alarms, um, is around $21,000 a year, but the students that complete this program will be able to actually pay only $6,500 a year in tuition after the first year. Um, and a great benefit of first year abroad as well is that it's open to students on just about every single major that we offer. So from engineering to biology to literature, if you wanna do this kind of program, it is open to you. Which takes me to my last slide which is to tell you a bit more about the benefits of first year abroad. Obviously we like advertising that there's a 70% off tuition, which really attracts a lot of people, particularly mom and dad. Um, but for the student, um, I think the important thing to bang on about is your actual experience when you're in one of those cities, whether it's London or in Spain or in Italy or in Panama, we really have an ethos to use the city as a textbook as much as possible. So our students here are not really sitting in the classroom every single day. They're going out to museums, they're going out on walks, they're going out with real experts to learn and make their classes come to life um, as they're studying here. All of our students internationally live in very centrally based flats. Um, we're here in Bloomsbury, where's where the FSU London campus is. Our class sizes internationally are also very small, about 20 per class. So that means that your transition from school to first year of university will be quite seamless because you'll be in very small class sizes. Um, there's a lot of things that the first year tuition includes, in, um, including weekend trips, a lot of bonding. We have a very familial kind of campus internationally. So it's a wonderful way to approach university by almost like attending a small liberal arts college your first year and then transferring and enjoying all the amenities and resources of a major public university for the next three years. So um, I'm here to help you find out if FSU is the right fit for you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Katie. Sorry about the alarm. <laughs> uh, no problem. Um, right, I'm gonna unmute all the panelists now. Um, and uh, just say thank you very much for those presentations and we're going to open it up to questions now. I can see that we've got um, got a few. Um, uh, don't worry about the alarm, Katie. The, the last time we hosted an event, it was at Notre Dame and we all got kicked out for, um, for 30 minutes, didn't we, Don? Yeah, fire alarm, yep. Yeah. Great. Okay, so um, we have a few questions here and I'm just going to open them up to everyone. Uh, the first question we have is, um, it, it, probably a, a fairly um, predictable question, but how are these universities reviewing and judging applicants when we can't take the SAT? Um, I'm not sure that that question is entirely factually correct because um, for the current year 12, so the junior year, um, there will be opportunities to take the SAT. There, there probably aren't as many as we would have liked. Um, but what we do know is that at the moment, the July and August tests are scheduled to go ahead um, as are the the June SAT and uh, sorry June ACT and maybe the June SAT, um, and uh, there will also be dates in September, October, November, and December. So if you are a Year Twelve, you still have plenty of opportunity to take it, but of course that may change. But that's it's a good question. Um, perhaps uh, Lisa, you might want to answer this. Um, or, although you, I, I do appreciate that you are a, text, a test flexible. Um, no worries, no problem at all. I think this is a good question because there's a lot of uncertainty uh, as we are right now. And I think tests can be, um, you know, the dates are still there, but maybe they'll be canceled. And I think it's okay that students are asking themselves, what if I can't take the test? 
It's a very difficult question to answer, though, because it really depends on which university you're applying to. So there's thousands of colleges and universities in the U.S. When you do your research, you identify which ones you're interested in. And I would say really start looking into what they're asking of you. And, you know, as you've heard from some of us uh, throughout this presentation, some of us will be test uh, mandatory, test flexible, test optional. There's also some different options there. You need to navigate that vocabulary and understand what that means. So if a school tells you that their standardized testing like AC ACT or SAT is mandatory, you have to take the test. If a school is test flexible, it means that if you're doing something else that could replace the tests, you're fine. So for a lot of schools, your educational system might just be that. It could be the A-levels, it could be the IB, the AB2 in Germany, the French back, a certain combination of AP courses. There's so many things that can come into play here that can help you apply to some schools that are test flexible without having to take the test. And then there are schools that are also completely test optional um, because that's something that they're not that interested in and they're looking at other factors within the application and you know um, our colleagues from FSU was talking about this idea of fit and that's a really important thing uh, for U US universities is to find finding the right fit within our student uh, application pool and so it's really important that you think that yes testing is important sure but it's one part of the application so when you're doing your research and you're finding out which universities you want to apply to, really make sure that you know what they're requiring of you and keep an eye on that because there's a lot of updates, there's a lot of things going on right now in the news about big colleges, big universities that are saying that they might go test flexible, they might go test optional in the future because of the situation that we're in. So keep an eye on the news, keep an eye on their website to make sure that you have the most up-to-date information. And I'm sure my colleagues will have more to add to that as well. Great, thanks very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that answers a few other kind of anxious questions that are here about the SAT. Um, obviously, some of these universities will require SAT or ACT, and some of these universities are test flexible or test optional. Um, but in all cases, um, it, it's worth obviously looking at what the normal requirements for the universities are and trying your best to achieve those requirements. Although, of course, um, we're going to be talking about holistic applications a bit. Um, and the, the tests are just a small part of the application. Um, and that answers one other person's question here, are, are the SATs vital in applying to universities? In some cases, yes, they are required. Um, James, I, I, I suppose you would say that, yes, they are vital, that you, you're going to need to do them if you want to go, is that right? That's right, yeah, the, the SAT or ACT for USC. Now, that's, I should probably say, we haven't made an announcement on the next cycle yet and, and, and our kind of testing policy, but we're hopeful that something will be said by admissions on that this week um but no we're not normally test optional um one thing that has been been brought up i've spoke to a few students already about about testing um and, and a lot of students have asked me and i should say I, I don't work directly in admissions but having spoke to the admissions team about this quite a bit a, lo a lot of students are asking is is uh, a certain test going to be more important than others as a result of the kind of the situation we find ourselves in or other tests going to take over and is the SAT going to be now more important than GCSEs or whatever it is um, and, and our general feeling so far is that is that no it's not it's not going to go down that route and actually there's, there, there may well be more importance on your kind of essay and on other elements of your of your application as jason said it's, it's a much more holistic process applying to the us and the admission process is much more holistic so um i wouldn't get too hung up on well what's going to replace this and what's going to be more important you know is this test is there more pressure on this test now because this test is kind of slightly up in the air i think i think if there's going to be more um importance on anything from a USC point of view as it currently stands the talk is that it's going to be on the actual application as a whole and the essays and that kind of thing great thanks James and um, there's a couple of questions here which are, are related to, to that idea of holistic admissions um, and Don perhaps you'd like to answer these and um, there's two here which are, are closely related so I'll ask them both one is is there anything that I can do to improve my chances of getting into one of these universities um, and uh, another person has said, uh, would you uh, recommend doing a lot, putting a lot of uh, time investment into volunteering to help uh, an application to a university like Notre Dame? And, and a third related question, I may as well ask it now, is during this unprecedented time, um, 
when many students won't be able to do the extracurricular things that they would normally be doing, what sort of things can they be doing instead? So first of all, uh, is there anything immediately that students can do regardless of the circumstances the world are in right now? Uh, I get this question a lot and I always try to give the, the same answer. And the, the, the best answer is be the best version of yourself. You don't have to change who you are, but kind of focus on what can you do to challenge yourself to get to the next level? So if that means upgrading your academic performance and your senior, your last year of high school, do that. If it means trying to take on more leadership, uh, you've been joining things, but not sticking your neck out to be accountable and, and run things, take that next step. So take whatever you're doing and move it up a notch. That's probably the best version of your, and we will, most of you will, will get to see your first three months of your last year before we make a, a final decision. As far as volunteering just to make your application look more socially concerned, I'd be very careful with that. If, if you've not done that consistently, then all of a sudden it's done. That's okay, but really describe what you learned from that experience. And is this part of what you want to do in your life along with your career? And your third question, uh, what was the third question? So the third question was at this time, what can students be doing when they would otherwise be doing extracurricular? Right. So now that you don't have the extracurriculars, I think one, um, it might be interesting for us in admissions that when we're reading your applications next year, for you to describe how you think what has just happened to this world, how do you think this might change the world? So intellectualize and internalize what you think's going on and maybe discuss that in your application. It doesn't have to be your primary presentation, but um, you know, I would do that. And then in addition, if you have free time that you, you used to have absorbed, read as much as you can and read a variety of things. And so that when you do apply to the colleges, tell us what you did with your free time. How did you, when you had a different structure around you, how did you use your time? And I would say, you know, just informative reading, uh, reading for pleasure, uh, but also thinking. And, you know, how have you come to think about things because of this experience? Uh, I think a lot of the colleges will be interested in, did you identify a way to use this in a positive way? Great. And, and just to, um, to clarify on one of those questions there, um, someone asked whether volunteering in particular would be a good thing to help to get into a university like Notre Dame. And would you agree with that? Yes. Uh, again, we're looking for people motivated to not just have their own success, but to use it to help others. So your pattern of doing that throughout your ages of 14 to 18 suggests that that's a sincere effort that we can ignite you even further in that. And so, yes, we will make admissions decisions in part over that. You still have to be strong in the academic effort and the intellectual abilities, but that does separate out a fair number of our applicants at Notre Dame, along with the sense of just being willing to work on teams and collaboratively rather than individual performer personality. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, a couple of questions here about financial aid, and I, I, I think I'll address those to you if you don't mind me, um, Lisa, because um, I, one of them asks about how the costs increase or change when you apply to different campuses globally. Um, so what would be your answer to that, Lisa? It's complicated would be my answer to this. <laughs> it varies greatly and I'm sorry to be giving these gray answers but that's really the situation where is we're in. It varies greatly depending on your background, where you're from and also who you're applying to. So if you remember FSU talked about being a state school and so fees if you're in the state or out of state will be different, fees for international students might be different. A lot of private universities have a system where fees are the same if you're uh, a student from the US, a domestic student, or if you're an international student. So it really, the prices can vary 
greatly across the board. And it's not that the most expensive is necessarily the, the sort of like top tier school. It's not about that. It's, it's so many things come to play here. So what you would want to do when you're researching uh, financial aid is first off, look at pricing. And it's not just tuition, it's everything else. It's living on campus, it's books, it's food, it's everything that you're gonna need. Um, and start thinking about how you're planning to afford this because some schools will be able to give you a substantial amount of scholarship support, some schools might not. Um, so depending on what they can give you, then you can really adjust your finances for the next four years. Um, if some of you are playing sports at a high level, identify schools that give sports scholarships. If you are maybe um, with a great deal of financial need, identify school that will look at that particularly. If you have an incredibly high SAT or if you're a renowned musician or painter, identify schools that will value this and might be able to give you a form of scholarship based on this. Something that you might want to also think about is, is a school what we call need blind or need aware? And that is complicated as well. So if a school is need aware, that means that when they read your application, they take into account the fact that you can or cannot afford their program. And that might inform their admissions decision. If they are need blind, it means that they make a decision based on the absolute merit of your application without thinking if you can afford uh, the program or not. So just to give you a sense at NYU, at NYU New York and Shanghai, we are need aware, but at NYU Abu Dhabi, we are need blind. And that means that in this case, we will make decisions on your application based on the merit of your application. We're also very lucky to be in a position that we can actually meet full fees. So if you are really uh, in need, we will be able to meet up to 100% of, uh, of your needs. And that can really make a huge impact in where you decide to go to school, depending on what they could be giving you. And that also really complicates things because you can apply to so many schools at once, especially if you're applying regular decision, which is a whole other conversation that we may have in a minute. Uh, and for you, the financial aid package that you're going to get, which probably will be a combination of financial um, aid in form of scholarship, uh, loan packages, and maybe study uh, work study opportunities, this financial package uh, might really impact the decision that you're going to make as to where you're going to study. Uh, but you know, we have different um, uh, schools here that maybe have a different view on financial aid, and I'd be very curious to know more, especially from FSU, how they view this sort of financial aid experience. Well, that, that's a great question. I was going to ask you, Katie, um, because you've got so many different campuses as well. Mm -hmm. How does financial aid differ between them, um, or does it make a difference? So yeah, no, it, it doesn't actually differ between it at all. Everything for us is still very centralized in Tallahassee. So all applications go through Tallahassee. You would not be able to apply directly to London, directly to Valencia, anything like that. So everything is housed there on main campus. And that's where all the decisions about admissions as well as financial aid and those types of things are um, offered. Um, we're a little bit in the dark about how some of the um, merit-based scholarships are given. They're really given to the top applicants. Um, it's the top percentage that will be offered those. So that's not something that we um, know how they're offering those. But the students that have the really, really strong grades, we're always encouraging them to apply. And then they are automatically considered for those merit-based scholarships at FSU. So when they open their admissions from the university, they'll see that they've been offered something straight away. Um, really, it's merit-based that we're offering um, at Florida State. We aren't offering any other kinds of international scholarships for students that are coming in. We do have scholarships that are available for international students once they're already studying at FSU, but those aren't guaranteed. Um, it's really the first year abroad program that I mentioned in my talk. That is the biggest way of definitively cutting costs. So it's not a scholarship as such, it's a tuition waiver, but it's a way to definitely take your tuition down by 70%. Um, and I did see someone on the Q&A ask that's open to international students. Absolutely 100% open to international students. It does not matter what passport you have. Uh, we'd be very welcome to have you apply to Florida State and apply to our first year abroad program. Great, thank you. That does answer my next question. And Don, I was going to ask you actually, because one question here from another student is, um, besides athletics and financial need, what other sort of merit scholarships are, that are there out there and how common are they? Um, do you want to talk a bit about the merit scholarships you've got at Notre Dame? Right, and, and before that, just to mention, 
So 57% of our students are on some form of financial aid scholarship from Notre Dame. And uh, the London and the English uh, applicants over the last couple of years have done very well with both need-based analyzed aid awards. We have a student coming this year with over a $60,000 need-based scholarship uh, from a very top-end high school, but his parents are retired and, and they just don't have a lot of, of income anymore. We also have two students that are receiving our merit awards, one of them getting a full ride all expenses. Uh, we, out of our 57%, 3% get merit, so we don't want to overstate this. Uh, it's a very competitive process, very few get it, but out of 2,000 freshmen, about 70 students will win these scholarships, and they range from a $25,000 award up to a full tuition room and board. Uh, depending on the competitions. You do not have to apply for it separately. When you apply to Notre Dame for admission, we immediately consider you for those because those are merit-based. So there's no added process you have to figure out to be a candidate. Now, we will contact you and say, you've done very well in the first read of your application, and we invite you to participate in the competition to be further reviewed. And then we do ask you to do a couple uh, things, including a video, and then usually coming to campus for an interview. Obviously this year, we did all those remotely. Uh, but the, the British students have done very well in our merit programs. Great, thanks, Don. Um, the, there's one very simple question here, and I think I know the answer for this, which is from, from the four universities here, which ones would provide financial aid for international students? Can I just get a nod if you all do that? Right. We have 250 of our 550 internationals are on aid. Great. Um, uh, Katie, you were shaking your head there. Is that because you don't get financial aid? Financial aid or scholarships? So the, I, maybe that's an important distinction that you could make. I think you actually know a bit more about that than I would, to be fair. I don't deal directly with the financials. Okay, well, I'll, I'll say it very, very simply. There, there is a difference between financial aid um, and scholarships. So scholarships are dependent on some sort of achievement and um, aid is dependent on need. Um, so um, some universities will give financial aid to students if they need it. And if, if the universities are able to afford that, it differs for national and international students. Um, and some universities will offer uh, merit-based scholarships and of course, sport, sports scholarships as well in some cases. Um, Okay, uh, there is a, there's a great question here about um, local employers. So um, do the universities here have connections with local employers to help advance um, employable skills and job prospects? Uh, yeah, I'll start. Uh, this is a very active uh, process for us with our alumni across the world. We're very active in Beijing and Sao Paulo, Brazil, certainly London. We probably have more graduates in London than any of those other cities. And the alumni network is extremely active in getting you internships while you are a student. And then as you start your career, as you go through your first 10, 15 years, it's not unusual, most Notre Dame graduates mention that it was the alumni network that helped present them with a lot of new opportunities. Great. Yeah, I can say the same as well for FSU quickly. We have um, tremendous student services and alumni networks available on campus to really push those opportunities, particularly with internships and externships during your undergraduate years. Um, we have those opportunities available on main campus as well as at all of our international campuses too. So you could still come do an internship in London, Panama with the United Nations. Um, we have those opportunities available. Great, thank you. A uh, couple of questions here, which I'm gonna direct at James. Um, not least because one of them is directly asking you, James, um, and you may or may not know the answer to this question, but at USC, how easy would it be for a student uh, to change majors in the freshman year? Um, that may be an easy question to answer, but here's to make it slightly more specific. Someone else has asked, um, how would it easy would it be for a student admitted into architecture to switch to game design in the first year? Yes. So the, 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 it's kind of the overview is it's, 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 
it's it's simple enough to change your major or to add a major um, in first year and afterwards. I think that, I think it's sixty percent of our students will end up changing their major at some point. So, um, and I know speaking to UK students, it's it's a kind of completely different mindset because it would be seen as a negative thing in the UK to to kind of commit to something and then want to do something else it's it's not at all uh, at USC and if you kind of if you're at USC and the Marshall School of Business and you see the the journalism school and some of the programs there and you kind of you know it it tweaks something in you we absolutely want to encourage you to explore that and if, if that's where you want to kind of finish up your degree then that's absolutely fine um, for this specific qu uh, question, I'll have to get back to you on that and look at the detail. I think it's, um, I know there is a, a crossover in uh, Dornsife with, with some of the kind of architectural programs and some of the game design programs. And I know there's some geo design courses that kind of loop different things in, but I'd have to, I'd have to speak to the person one-on-one um, -on -one and kind of look at the detail of that. I'm not a hundred percent. Great. Thanks, James. Jason, do you mind if I add something quickly about this? Yeah, just a general sort of piece of advice. So um, it's really important to remember that when you're applying to university in the US, you can apply undecided. You can apply not knowing what it is that you want to study. And that is actually OK for most institutions, because in most of those liberal arts uh, universities and colleges, you actually don't have to decide your major until maybe the end of the second year. That gives you a lot of flexibility and freedom to explore to mature, to grow, to change your mind. And I think it's really important to remember this, especially if you come from a UK background, where everything, when you focus, your, when you apply, everything is focused on the topic that you want to study. That's what you're going to talk about in your essay, in your interview. If you're applying to an American school, you need to talk about yourself and us. So talk about us and talk about yourself. We don't really care so much about what it is that you want to study unless it's ultra specialized. I'm thinking maybe dance or a specific instrument. But if it's more of a general broad topic um, that you could study in any university around the world, then chances are you might change your mind 20 times before you choose a major. So it's really important that in your application you focus on other things rather than just the subject of study. Lisa, I think that's really right. Um... You know, a third of our students at Notre Dame changed their major from what they said they might study when they applied. And there, some of them are big changes. Uh, and also, one of the advantages of coming to any of our universities is, you know, I, I noted a fourth of our kids are in each area of discipline, but about half their classes are not in their discipline. Some of them, even yeah. two-thirds, are these broad liberal arts and, and yeah. a a broader curriculum. That's what American higher education believes in, is giving you a broader set of skills. And then maybe developing specific skills within those areas. But um, that's one of the real advantages of coming to America for your undergraduate education, is the freedom to think about a lot of different things and then change your focus if that thinking changes your focus. Uh, so we're all very not only tolerant of it, we're actually very encouraging of that. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's the same at NYU. We have 240 areas of studies. I mean, there's so many things that you can study. It's a bit crazy, really. I'll add one last thing as well, that it, for us, it doesn't matter that your, your A levels were in certain subjects. That doesn't mean you can or cannot continue on to certain things at American undergraduate. I've recruited many students that did A levels in hard sciences and realized their sudden passion for creative writing and history, and then came to the U.S. and did that. So those are not that, that's not the same thing as, as here in the U.K. as well. The, in the U.S., it really the world is really your oyster to explore and, and figure out what you're passionate about across those four years. Great, and um, that's uh, I'm I'm glad that that you guys talked about that because it's one of the the key differences between applying to the U.S. and the U.K. Um, is this idea that in America you've got the, the freedom to, to choose and to change your mind while you're there and you're generally encouraged to do so. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to ask a, another couple of questions that um, have come in. Um, there is a, a question, again, directed at USC, but I think it could be answered generally, which is, um, are there opportunities for students studying in the UK at university to do um, year abroad in America um, and, and if so, is there financial aid available for that sort of thing? 
So is this, uh, I saw this question, is this, is this students studying at a UK university wanting to study abroad at USC? Is that? That's the way I interpret it, yes. Okay, great. We have, we have around about 30 partnerships in the UK, um, just the UK, with a lot more in Europe. Um, and we have partnerships with, with most of the major uh, top-ranked universities in the UK, study abroad partnerships with, in London, we have partnerships with Imperial, with Kings, with Queen Mary, um, UCL, um, kind of across the board. And so there's, there's a lot of opportunities to study at USC if you're, if you're at one of our partner institutions and, and vice versa, we send students from USC to, to Kings and UCL every, every year. Um, the financial aid, from USC perspective, I, I didn't kind of touch on this earlier. We, we offer merit-based scholarships to international students, but we don't offer financial aid. Um, so I just thought I'd kind of mention that because I know it wasn't mentioned earlier. And, and in terms of from coming from a UK university, I guess that would be, um, I guess that would be a question for, um, for the UK university and for whether you could get financial aid to, to go and study in USC or, or look at it from, from, from that way, I guess. Um, conscious that I don't work in the kind of study abroad side of things, so I can't give a kind of a much more detailed answer than that, unfortunately. Great. Um, well, thanks very much for that. Um, there's, because we've reached seven o'clock, but I just want to get through these last couple of questions. And there's, um, there's one more question here that I think is quite interesting, um, which is uh, relating to the current situation. Um, this person has asked, due to the current situation, will the deadline for applications for um, August, September 2021 entry be, um, be extended? So 2021 is next year. So many of those um, students will be thinking of, about uh, applying um, this coming autumn, so in a few months time, in order to be admitted for September next year. Um, do any of the universities here think that the deadlines, which are normally um, October to December, depending on where you're applying and whether you're applying early or not, will, will any of them be extended, do you think? You know, I guess I'll start. It, it all depends on how much, much more disruption for how long we go. We want to make sure students are comfortable feeling they can present their, themselves and, and their academic potential to us. Mm -hmm. If we feel they're not able to do that within the time frames that we normally have, we will extend those deadlines and we'll announce them months before those deadlines are due. So I think students should stay built, uh, you know, involved with the colleges they're most interested in and see what those deadlines might be. But right now, we expect there will be enough information for the students to present themselves successfully in the time frames that the students in the past. How we use the test scores, if there are fewer tests to be taken, uh, it's fine. You're all on the same level with everybody else. They also weren't able to take it four times. Uh, so if you take it twice in the fall and there are enough offers in the fall that you can take it twice with a little bit of separation between the two tests, fine. We may also go test optional. You know, USC is thinking about it. We're thinking about it. My guess is we're all thinking about it. We just haven't felt that it's time to make that decision yet. So I would stay tuned, but just generally know that we certainly want you to be comfortable that you could present yourself and that we'll also adjust using our common sense for what have we used in the past. This year may be a unique year where we use things differently, but just know we'll be fair to everybody. Nobody's gonna gain an advantage over this. Great. Okay, um, I've got uh, one question um, slash request here from someone, um, and I know who it is, but they're gonna remain nameless. Um, th th someone just wants me to clarify about um, financial aid again, because, um, the finance is quite a tricky area of applying to university in America. Um, this person just wants me to clarify that scholarships are a form of financial aid um, in that you are, of course, getting money for a scholarship. Um, it's just that one um, is need-based while um, scholarships are merit-based. So just to clarify again, um, you can get need-based aid where it depends on your need and you can get um, financial aid which is merit-based where it depends on your achievement, whatever that achievement might be. 
I'm just going to finish with a couple of um, very simple questions, which I, I, I think I can answer on behalf of everyone. One is about law and one is about medicine. Those questions are always the easiest to answer because you can't do law or medicine as an undergraduate um, in America. Um, one person has asked about um, medicine for international students. That is pretty much impossible um, as an international student. Um, I say pretty much, um, it, you can basically say it is impossible um, as an international student. Um, it's extremely difficult. And I think the statistics are a, a, in the single figures of international students who study medicine each year in the US. Um, and I'm mostly Canadians as well, so. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> One, uh, a few people have asked about the SAT test and just to, to clarify on that, as it stands, the June SAT date will be subject tests um, if it goes ahead, but um, there is a strong likelihood that the College Board will allow students to take the SAT on that date. If you are registered for the, SA, the June date, um, you may be given the opportunity to swap from subject tests to the SAT if it goes ahead. Um, the, uh, the, the registration is not yet open for July um, and onwards dates for SAT or ACT, but it should be quite soon. So um, as soon as those open, it's worth um, registering for spots on those tests because if they do get cancelled, at least you'll get your money back, you'll be able to swap to a later date. Um, there, the, there is one more question which was about sports. Um, I know that you guys are not specialists in sports, um, but uh, someone was asking how this situation would affect sports recruitment for this year. Does anyone have any idea? I'm going to take that as a no. Um, That's a really tricky one. I mean, NYU were not strong in sports. I'll be really, really clear about that. We're a Division three school. Um, from what I'm hearing across the board from other schools, um, what it can affect is potential visits so being able to meet a coach, being able to, in a sense, have that connection with people, being able to go and play, uh, um, that could be an issue. Um, but everybody, every, every school that I talk to, everybody is so agile at the moment in putting things in place that will use technology to make sure that no one's losing out. So, I mean, Notre Dame at USC, you guys, FSU, you were much more like, stronger in sports, but I assume that your sports departments are putting things in place to make sure that they can still connect with the talent that's out there, even if the talent is not on their doorstep. So I, I, would, I would really think that they are doing this, but it's something that you need to have a conversation with the coaches directly at the university that you're interested in. Yeah, I, I agree. Our coaches are so organized and competitive with the national level of sports that uh, they're on all this. Just trust me, if you're a good enough athlete for our coaches to be interested in, between you and your coach, you know, convey your interest to, those, to that coaching staff and let them respond to you. Great. Well, that is it for all the questions. So, um, all that remains is for me to say thank you very much again to everyone who attended and listened and thank you very much indeed to the speakers. Uh, so James from USC, Don from Notre Dame, Katie from FSU and Lisa from NYU. Thank you very much indeed. It's been really, really helpful and I really appreciate the agility uh, of everyone um, to be able to jump online and, and give these sort of information sessions at this time and I'm sure everyone appreciates it. So. Um, thank you very much. And I will be sharing this presentation with all the registered attendees afterwards. Um, I will share the presentations um, with the attendees as well. And this meeting um, or this webinar has been recorded, so that will get shared as well. Um, for those of you who have kindly said that we can pass on your contact details, we'll be doing that to, the, um, to these guys. Um, and uh, they will get in touch with you about any more information that you need from their universities. Uh, but in the meantime, um, have a great Easter and have a great night. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.